Thanks for coming to this roundtable on academic citizenship beyond borders. Um, as well as the audience in this room, we have a live stream audience. Welcome to the people on the live stream as well. So the audience goes beyond um, this room, and that's very appropriate for an event thinking about academic citizenship beyond borders. Um, for the live stream audience, you're welcome to send questions on Twitter. There's a, a, a, tweet, a Twitter account you can tweet your questions to, and somebody will field them. And just a note that if you want to, we, we can have lots of time for questions and a discussion period at the end. And because we're live streaming, we ask that everybody um, uses a microphone so the live stream audience can um, pick it up. And we'll be, um, two of our participants are not here in the room. They'll be joining us on Skype also. So another kind of connection. Um, I, I'm Sophia Woodman, I'm in sociology and one of the co-conveners -conven with Alistair Hunter, who's over there, of the Citizens, Nations and Migration Network, which was one of the sponsors of this event. We'd also like to thank our other sponsors, the Global Development Academy, um, the Centre for the Study of Modern and Contemporary History, and the Back Solidarity Edinburgh. Um, which has been centrally involved in organizing this. So we'll have conversations today on China, Bangladesh, Uganda, and Turkey in that order. Um, they're short because we're covering four countries, but we really wanted to look at various situations around the world um, uh, and some information as well with, um, on how Edinburgh is responding to these and other um, challenges in which scholars and scholarship are at risk. So each of the country um, um, sections will be in the form of a conversation with an interlocutor who's here in the room um, talking with somebody uh, else and they will introduce the, the, the main speaker. Um, and as I said, we'll have a chance for discussion in the end, and we're happy if you want to bring in other country contexts, other issues around this theme, um, and so on. So first, I'd like to welcome um, Professor James Smith, VP International and Professor of African and Development Studies, to say something about how Edinburgh is addressing academics at risk around the world. Um, unfortunately, James has to leave us early, so after his um, remarks, we'll have a brief period for questions um, if you want to ask any. So, over to you, James. I need three hands to do this. Excuse me a second. Um, thanks, thanks very much, uh, for, um, and thanks for inviting me to a few words. Overdressed. Um, I, I'm not, I don't normally wear a suit, but we uh, just rushed from a graduation ceremony where we were giving... Uh, the Principal's Medal to two of our, our um, undergraduate students who uh, run a charity which provides a social part um, in Greece. Um, the Principal's Medal to undergraduates, which is quite unusual, but I guess it does speak to specific ways in which the university community uh, provides support to not just academics at risk, but, but populations at risk. Uh, and I guess maybe within my, my remarks, I think it's important for us to think about what the university is. The university is this institution and um, a collection of mailing lists and all kinds of things which uh, govern and regulate us, but it's also the community of 52, 53,000 uh, students and staff who uh, I, I think what I know have different viewpoints and different beliefs and come from different parts of the world. So I think one of the challenges we have as a complex, diverse, uh, quite opinionated community is thinking about how we support uh, people in different contexts in different places. Uh, I, I was thinking about academic citizenship a bit this morning when I was just writing some notes to myself, um, and, and it is really it's quite, quite dear to me. I went to study for my master's in South Africa in uh, 1996. Um, it was a very exciting time. It was the, the new South Africa. Um, Mandela was president. Everything was very exciting. Everything was very hopeful. But, uh, and I used to hang out in, in what was euphemistically called the postgraduate club on, on the campus of Vich University in Johannesburg. It was actually essentially a bar. 
Uh, and I used to speak to older professors, older academics, including my supervisor, uh, and they talked of a very different uh, South Africa. They talked of giving a lecture on Marxist geography and identifying secret police in the back of the class. They would be wearing suits, much like myself. All the students were wearing shorts and T-shirts. Uh, they would talk about being tortured under, inter under interrogation, being made to stand on bricks for hours on end, and if they stood off the bricks, they would get beaten. Uh, they, they talked about doing field work in townships as, as, as white academics, which meant leaving after midnight and avoiding roadblocks and, and, and risking uh, imprisonment if they were caught. Uh, and of course, they talked about their friends who lost their lives, such as uh, Professor David Webster, who's an anthropologist at my university, who was uh, assassinated by the secret police in 1989, essentially because his research was uncovering some of the atrocities that were taking place in townships. So had this kind of juxtaposition, I guess, of this kind of happy, joyful, forward-looking South Africa, but this kind of very recent memory of, of some of the, the academic impositions that, that were happening on campus and within classrooms. So I, I guess that is really important in many ways. It's important not to forget that. But it also makes me think that living in a university like Edinburgh, in a city like Edinburgh, in a, in a country like Scotland in the UK, we can all become quite complacent, I think, um, apart from the occasional rude email, and I do get some exceptionally rude emails from people, um, maybe the odd offensive tweet or really offensive comment, especially if one writes a, a, a discovery, if you write an article for the, the Scotsman in particular, you tend to get quite rude comments from people. But that's the extent of it. You can, as an academic, I feel I can do, do and say pretty much uh, as I please as long as I, I, I'm careful about how I phrase things. So I don't feel encumbered and constrained in that way. We're a very international university, as you know. It's one of the things we're proud of. We have a, a staff and student population of uh, 21,500 uh, uh, from overseas, from outside the UK, from 172, 173 countries. And that's clearly wonderful. And it provides opportunities to have conversations. It provides opportunities to think about how we connect with people and academics in other parts of the world. It can also, I find, potentially be quite problematic. It can mean when we're trying to think about how we do things in some parts of the world, we have communities who are almost at loggerheads with each other or risk offending and upsetting each other. So I think for me, one of the things we, we have as a, as a huge possibility, a huge potential is to think about how we can make more of that community and have more productive conversations across some of the delineations which might uh, actually be, be quite complex. Uh, so divergent viewpoints are really good, but I think we can probably make more of them, and we can make them maybe a bit less antagonistic, and that's something I find very, very much uh, very important in this role. Uh, it's a week of, of degree ceremonies. On Tuesday, we gave an honorary degree to Maurice, Maurice Wren, who's the CEO of uh, Refugee Council, and that was a very nice uh, ceremony. He obviously has made a massive contribution over 20, 20 or 30 years of his career. And one of the uh, memories I evoked in that degree ceremony was of Professor Max Bourne, who was a professor of uh, natural philosophy in the university from the 30s to the 50s when he uh, was awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics. Max Bourne was uh, German. Max Bourne was uh, kicked out of his, his job in his university in Germany in 1934 due to the imposition of anti-Semitic laws. He then went into exile in the UK. He was then stripped of his citizenship, and it was at that point he was given a, a professorship at the UK in Edinburgh uh, at that time. And I guess it speaks a little bit to um, history of what Edinburgh's been doing around working with and accepting refugees. And it speaks, I think, apart from the human cost that, that Professor Bourne and his family suffered, the personal cost of having to relocate very rapidly, it speaks to the possibility of the loss if there hadn't been that support in place, if there hadn't been the ability for him to move countries. And I think that is really important as well. So as I said, I think the university is not um, a, a place, a thing. It's not um, me as a, a vice principal. It's all of us. It's all of us in our kind of complicated, contested glory. Uh, it's a set of communities. It's a community. It's a community which is both from somewhere else uh, and look somewhere else and all the places in between, and that's really important. Uh, and I think that suggests that we need to work quite hard to make the most of that community. I think we do a lot as a university to support academic freedoms. I think we could do a lot more, and I think it's incumbent upon all of us to work together to think about how we can do that. Um, maybe I can give three, maybe they're not quite themes, but they're three ways in which I feel the university does, does at least something, uh, and we'll hear a bit more about that today. And it's really um, great that we have Academics for Peace and organizations like that, which do really con uh, concrete things. 
and I, I think also push and provoke and make the university aspire to do better things. I think that's really important. So most of the things we do which are good are, I believe, driven from below, not from above. I guess we offer practical support, very, very practical things. We are a partner with um, a council for at-risk academics. Each year we support um, between three and six academics to spend time here, which gives them a break or allows them to spend time out of the country at which they were at risk. Um, I, th I think we can do more there. I, I think what, we, what I tend to find is those academics tend to end up accommodated in schools in, in social sciences and humanities. I find possibly the other colleges are a bit less accommodating in terms of saying, well, we can help here. And I think there is an institutional conversation we have to have there to recognise we all have a responsibility to work with organisations like CARA and support academics. Uh, we're developing quite a lot of foundations. We have a very productive partnership we're about to launch. I'd, I'd hope to be able to say something today, but I can't yet, uh, with the Middle East Based Foundation, which will support um, refugee students from Syria, Palestine, and the Yemen, um, 10 full scholarships a year to study in Edinburgh. So these are kind of concrete, practical things. And this is where I think the university, the institution, can play an important role, provoked by the community here. Uh, we provide different support for undergraduate students who are uh, refugees or seeking asylum in Scotland. We essentially don't charge fees for students in those positions. I, I think that's really great. I think many Scottish universities have, have, have followed suit. I think we could do more to help refugees make the leap from where they are outside the university into the university. But again, it's a start. It's how can we work on these things together. The second way in which I think we can work really effectively is through partnership. Um, and I guess partnership is quite a problematic, contested term. I'm a professor of African development, and quite a lot of what I spend my time thinking about is what does partnership mean in contexts where there's massive asymmetries between one partnership and another. And, you know, partnership gets taken a bit like sustainability. It's you know, seen as a good thing. It might not be a good thing. But I think in a university like this, we have to think about what partnership means, and we have to think about the levels at which it's constituted. A partnership can be... Uh, an, organisa an organisation led by students or staff having a relationship with a body elsewhere. It might be an institutional partnership. It can be individual relationships between academics. It can be all of these things. And I think we have to recognise, much as we prob should problematise what partnership means, we need to recognise that at different levels, those partnerships can drive many, many different things. And I think quite a lot of what we'll be hearing about today is essentially about partnership in, in, in many ways. So I think that's really important can, of course, lead to those difficult conversations. Should we have a partnership in, in some parts of the world? Should we have a, a stronger partnership in others? And, and that's where I think the contestations come back into play. And in many ways, I'm um, pulled back to thinking about South Africa and apartheid South Africa and, and cultural boycotts and educational boycotts. And they're often things which are evoked in a university like this. Why are we doing this in that country? Why should, why should we should be pulling back? And because we're such a, a complex university, a complex set of uh, people, uh, we have to think quite carefully about that kind of thing. So partnership is good, but I think we should talk about it more. And three, I think, is really about self-reflection. I think we need to reflect on what higher education is, uh, and especially perhaps on, on the particular legacy of universities like this one in the English-speaking world, especially the old universities, the, the legacies they've had in shaping what higher education is and how it's perceived and how it's manifested itself overseas. So I think reflecting on that history is important, reflecting on that legacy is really important, um, even thinking about what an Enlightenment university actually means in the modern context is important, and I think thinking about what values we can take from that and what values we should be developing in a more modern context where the way in which higher education is developed in different contexts and the freedoms and constraints people have are quite uh, different. And in some cases, might be to a certain extent due to things that we did as a university in the UK in the past. So I think that's really important. Reflecting on the nature of partnerships and those ethics is really important. And I have to say, as a white male professor of African studies and African development, based in uh, a, a colonial um, byproduct centre of African studies, I feel the need to think about that very urgently, actually, thinking about how we construct knowledge, who we construct knowledge for, and what that means for higher education elsewhere as well as here. And I think that might be something that m myself, and I see Sarah Jane, my colleague, is here, uh, and Zoe, we feel very keenly in African studies, but I also think generally it's something we should be reflecting on and problematizing in all disciplines and all levels of the university. That, that's really important. 
Um, I guess I have to make an apology. Um, I was at a graduation. I got to go to uh, go and have dinner with uh, Dr. Dennis McQuaggy, who's receiving an honorary degree tomorrow. Um, maybe I'll just tell you why he's receiving an honorary degree, and it'll make a bit more sense. Um, Dr. McQuaggy is a, a gynecologist who's fought tirelessly for justice for women in the Congo, and he's spent the last 10 or 20 years treating women who, su who suffered systematic sexual abuse. He's built hospitals, he advocates for women, he lobbies for, um, uh, for equal gender rights. And how, in doing that, he's come into massive, massive conflict, both with uh, the government in the Congo, but also rebel groups. And a few years ago, he and his family survived an armed assault in, in his own home by playing dead. So again, going back to um, maybe going back from the kind of relatively stale academic conversation we might have here to realities of um, what an unfreedom might be, what an unfree world might be in a context like the Congo is really important. So I think there's a constant need and an urgent need for solidarity um, and for action. Uh, and I think the university, through the community, because that's what the university is, does a lot. Uh, and I'm always amazed and, and heartened by what students do, what staff do, what academics do, what professional staff do, uh, and that's really powerful. And, and I think what the institution of the university can do is provide ways to help those activities and those partnerships and, and those conversations for us. There's always more to be done. Uh, and um, I think it's important not to recognize that. It's also important, I think, not to beat, us up, beat ourselves up about that. We need to find ways to do more, a bit more productively and a bit more efficiently. And if we think about partnerships, and we think about our history and our legacy, then I think we can do quite a lot, quite a lot more by doing a little bit more, if you see what I mean. So that's it, really. I would just like to um, welcome you to Edinburgh. I, I'm really sorry I have to leave. I hope you have a very productive conversation. And I'd just like to uh, really congratulate uh, Sophia and, and Isabel for um, all they've done in bringing this together with support from elsewhere and, uh, and also for what you're going to be talking about a bit later today, which I think is a really good example of where the university can do something really good through a little bit of a challenge from the academic community um, and, and, uh, and through what you believe in and, and who you're working with. So thank you very much. Um, that's it for me. But I'm happy to take any questions if you have any or not. No. All right, so I'm switching from the role of moderator to the role of interlocutor. Um, so um, I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Tim Pringle, who's a senior lecturer in labor, social movements, and development in the Department of De Development Studies at SOAS, the University of London. And his work focuses on labor relations, trade unions, um, and uh, labor and social movements in the socialist, post-socialist world. I mean, mostly China, Vietnam, and Russia, um, um, as well as labor mig migration in China. He's been an active trade unionist all his working life, so he brings that perspective to his um, uh, academic research. And since January 2017, he's been the editor of the China Quarterly. And as some of you will know, um, the China Quarterly had some prevails um, this year that um, Tim, as the new editor, had to deal with. So no Tim, idea what you're talking about. <laughs> so Tim, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about um, what happened with the China Quarterly affair. Okay, the China Quarterly incident, as we call it. I, I, I think what, what, I, what I tried to do at the time, uh, the media storm that surrounded this incident, was really to look forward, and that's what I'm going to do now. But that's, first of all, it is useful to clarify uh, the past. What happened was, to, I think, their regret, Cambridge University Press, who publish China Quarterly on their website and other outlets are called Cambridge Core, came to a uh, unilateral decision to censor or withdraw or make unavailable on the internet 304 articles, book reviews, <clears throat> and, and, and other essays published in the China Quarterly, going way back to about 1961, I think, the earliest was. These articles touched on subjects that are politically sensitive in, in, in China, such as Xinjiang, Tibet, Taiwan, and more recently, issues around uh, democratization or the move towards universal suffrage in, 
in Hong Kong to, uh, you know, what, what academics really... Academics don't really hold very much absolutely dear, but they do hold academic freedom, the right to publish dear. So, and so I think that was absolutely the right decision. That's what happened. It was a decision that China courtly played no part in, uh, but I like to think we played our, played our part in getting the, de de uh, the decision reversed. Looking forward, I think, you know, th this was an incident. It reflects really on a wider issues of censorship, academic freedom, and as Torrance links that himself with, with, uh, with uh, university autonomy, the autonomy of the university as an institution. I think these are, are very interesting issues that China is grappling with, that the, the, the, the, the internet higher education globally is grappling with, is under enormous change now. Uh, what is taught in one country is often taught somewhere else as well. This, uh, this example here of this, this streaming here, so you know, this will be going out, you know, be available on YouTube or whatever. So I think these issues are not just confined to one university, one country. They are, they are global issues. Each country brings something different to the table, and the, the issue of censorship and academic freedom in China is a, is, is a problem. It's a, big, it's a big problem that, you know, that we will continue to have to grapple with, for sure. Yeah, so um, you published a very good op-ed piece, you know, soon after this affair came out, talking about um, uh, the, the fact that articles in the journal had gone through peer review, so um, evoking a kind of scholarly community um, and that community's decision about what should be published in the journal um, and that you, you felt that was a strong justification for um, challenging this censorship. So could you say something about that? Why, um, why particularly evoke the idea of peer review um, in relation to um, what is valid knowledge? And um, obviously saying, well, scholars decide, not the state what's going to be, um, what, what can be published in our journal. Yeah, I, I, I, I, to, to, to add to that, I don't want to challenge censorship just in, in, in China. I think, as I made clear in, in that op-ed, and indeed uh, on, on China Quarterly's websites as well, that in response to the, to the incident, that, that, you know, that we, we have a duty, it sounds very pompous, this, doesn't it? But we have a duty as academics to challenge if and where we can censorship anyway. For some people, as James pointed out, that can be very, very risky. People pay very high prices for that. I think it's part of our, our job as, as universities, relatively autonomous universities in, in liberal democracies to try and provide solidarity. I think that's a, a key way, whether it be through partnerships, whether it be through self-reflection or support for academics. Why did I draw on that scholarly community? Well, I have to say, I didn't have peer review in mind. I think peer review is an extremely part if not unproblematic part of the publication, academic publication business, because it is a business, but it's, but it's much more than a business, of course, as well. I was really drawing on the fact, um, reflecting on the idea that this is a dynamic, dynamic picture, really. And if we look at China over the last 20 years, let's just take the last 20 years, period of 2000 and turn of the century to about, around about 2013, China went through really a kind of a, an opening of the space, not just in academia, not in those, those opportunities for partnerships with academic abroad, academics abroad, outside China rather, but also in civil society generally. There was a kind of flowering of, of, of, of, of research really, and, and, this, and this was particularly evident in my own area. I work on labor relations which is, and labor movements, which itself is, are quite sensitive areas of research. And it was, you know, working on that in the 90s was quanti qualitatively different from working on it in the first decade up to about 2013 of this century. And, and I, was, I was kind of drawing on that, that sense, uh, the, the outcomes of, of that sense of partnership, the hopes of that sense of partnership. In my own field of research, it kind of came with a, with a rise in the confidence of Chinese workers to express themselves, to, to voice their, their opposition to, to exploitative employers, and indeed to exact extract wage concessions and wage rises from them. So it was an exciting time. Even collective bargaining, which is kind of on, on the down in this country, was, was seen to become on the agenda in China. Now, what I wrote about then is I, I feel that with the, with, the, with the change in the political climate, 
reflected in laws like the foreign NGO law, like the charities law to a lesser extent, and like, uh, like the uh, new publications law. And with the general narrowing of the space since those heady days of civil society to operate and indeed for academics to operate, I, I feel that, that, that flowering is under risk. I feel that the, the more repressive or, or, or the closing off of civil society organisations, uh, the increased politicised atmosphere on the university since about 2013 where the role of the political councillor has been become much more much more important than it was in in in the first decade of the, of the 21st century where uh, uh student consultation systems are in operation where students radical ideas are linked bizarrely to mental health issues and stuff like this so there's a general con a general tightening of con Control, yeah, I think that's the right word, control, on what can be taught, what can be read, and what can be published within China. And I, and I, and, and I think that puts at risk some of, the, some of the great achievements, some of the achievements, rather, of the previous decade. And uh, so that's what I was drawing on, really. That's what I, what I think needs rescuing, needs evenings like tonight and, and, and other discussions that we need to, need to think about. And I hope you know, China Quarterly you know, is never going to censor anything Due, due to it being politically sensitive. That's simply, simply not going to happen. We, we go on, on rigor, gen, uh, generating knowledge and, and contribution to, to, to the academe, not, not, not what governments in China or anywhere else feel, feel should or shouldn't be published. Mm. So, I mean, it's since come out that one of the very big publishers, Springer and Nature, has also uh, made a similar agreement to censor content, and, and this may be a lot more content and... Um, uh, so the, the trend is towards accepting some of the terms that Chinese authorities want to place in terms of limiting um, academic freedom. Um, is there any, um, wh how should we address these kinds of broader issues beyond the specific case of the China Quarterly? Uh, yeah, I think you know Springer's decision. The, the great thing about CUP's decision is that they reversed it and reversed it quickly, and they responded to not wanting to romanticise, but to our community, the academic community, and indeed beyond as well, a community provoked, as James said, by the wider community, by the wider citizenship. I think that what Springer have done is they've said they're not going to reverse it. Now there is a difference between Springer and CUP, Cambridge University Press. Cambridge University Press is what it says on the label, it's the university press. It's not there for business first, it's there for, it, uh, whereas Spr it's not there to make money first, it does make a lot of money but that's not its primary aim. Um, Springer is different, Springer is, is a commercial book press. Uh, but as, as um, uh, the, the, the newly, newly uh, elected, I think he's elected or perhaps appointed president of the International Publishers Association said recently in talking about China and talking about academic freedom and publishing generally and welcoming new members to this, to this association, which I think now covers just about 60 countries in the world, so publishing is, is much more than just a commercial enterprise. Publishing is about human progress, first and foremost. After that, it's about, it, it you know, can have commercial size to it, but it is primarily about that, and, and, and actually, the, the country that's made the, one of the greatest contributions to that progress over the years, who invented paper, who invented the printing press, is in fact China as well. So, you know, these are difficult times, but they're very exciting times as well. How to negotiate decisions like Springer? Well, I'm, I, I think, you know, we had a bit of a good steer from, from, from James there. We need to support academics in danger. We need to provide that kind of solidarity that they may or may not require. We need, to, we need to think about partnerships very, very carefully. We need to think about as, as, as institutions with a relative amount of autonomous control over what we do and what we research, we need to think about very carefully about the terms of the partnerships that we engage in with institutions that may or may not, may not enjoy that control. I think that's very important. We need to look at the fine print. And it's not all bad. The, you know, the Congress, US Congress has just come up with an with a interesting report which is looking at 12 universities in partnership with Chinese universities on mainland China, that is far from negative reading. There are problems with internet, internet access being, being slowed down, but no direct limitations on what students and scholars can't teach and publish on there. So, you know, it's not all bad. And, and I, think, I think the other thing that James mentioned, and I think this is very important, and indeed the events of the last three or four months have, have you know, with China Corfu have led, led me 
to, to kind of self-reflect over, over what we're doing and how we do it and why we do it. I think, you know, we need, we, you know, it's all very well shouting at another government or, or, or our own government or any government, but we also need to reflect on what we do as well. We need to think about very carefully about issues of self-censorship. The Hong Kong, Hong Kong, I think it's Journal, a teacher's association recently came up. They felt that in Hong Kong, which is a, a territory under pressure, around issues of academic freedom right now, especially since the Occupy Central movement back there in 2014. Um, they found that the greatest threat to academic freedom and censorship was, was indeed not, made, not the government in Beijing, but self-censorship. So we need to think about that, that as well. I think these are all issues about what we can do, how we can respond to this, you know? Getting angry and shouting is great, but we also need to think about the kind of stuff James is talking about as well. Mm -hmm. All right, well, that seems a bit a good point to open it up to any questions um, for Tim. We have a short, we have like five minutes for questions or comments from the audience um, on China or to address to Tim, and, and, and, and then we move on to Bangladesh. And maybe you could say who you are if you want to. <laughs> uh, hi there. Um, I'm also involved in Back Solidarity, um, and I've just finished my PhD here at Edinburgh. I'm Harriet Files. Um, yeah, I was wondering. I was. I work on Turkey, um, and I actually noticed some similarities with what you were talking about in relation to the regression after 2013 and the encroachment on civic society and civil society. And I wondered if there was, uh, and that's exactly what I've experienced in Turkey, and th there's clear, obvious domestic reasons for that, but I wondered if there was more international reasons that you could discuss that are causing what, what I could see as a global regression in terms of academic freedom. And I think even in the UK, there's been this intense bureaucratization and increasing like politicization of, of what is and isn't acceptable within academia. So yeah, I was just wondering if you could expand on that on, in terms of global issues. Uh, thank you, I think, I think that's a, a great question. Congratulations on, on finishing your PhD <laughs> as well. Um, I think obviously what happened in the square there, in the park there in, in, in, in Turkey, in Istanbul, I think, and, and what happens in China and Hong Kong, they're very different contexts, mm. and the governments have very different reasons for doing this. I think, and indeed, what's happening here, that you know, academic freedom in a very different way is under threat here in, in the UK by uh, managerialism in, in, in universities, by um, the, uh, the uh, uh, who controls the purse strings over research, and, and you know, so this is, you know, this is a complex global picture, as you say. Each situation, each specific context unfurls in very different circumstances. I think what marks China out on, on reflection, I think, is, is that China is, is, is, is, is the growing, uh, is a, a hugely growing market in international publishing. It has huge clout, it has huge influence beyond publishing in, in, in, economic, in economic, uh, uh, economic growth, economic development, and also is looking outward as well. It's not in the old days or in the, in the 90s before China entered the World Trade Organization and up until about 28, it's about investment going into China and generating the so-called factory of the world. Now it's about Chinese investment also going out and the influence that that has going to Turkey as well, for that matter. And, and so I think that what makes China, how I look at China is this is not just about China, this is a, a, a global situation. Now whether there are links between uh, what happened in Turkey, uh, what happens in, in, in China, what happens elsewhere, South Africa or wherever, Bangladesh or the UK. I, I think we, we can speculate, but I think to me what is, and, and that would be speculation, I think, there, but there are, some com there are some maybe more concrete things we can look at. Firstly, is that at the same time as access and being able to publish is being opened up by the internet, the ability of the state to create as Foucault called that docile student body is improving as well. So those technologies can go the other way as well. So I think that's one thing, and that, and that can happen anywhere. That can happen through managerial surveillance of students, making sure they attended class so the UK border agency keeps them happy, or it can happen through direct censorship of content in the classroom as, as may or may not, as may happen in Turkey and certainly does happen in China. So I think there's a, there's a concrete, concrete dividing, uh, concrete link there. And I think the, the other thing is, is the, the internationalization of higher education. You know, as I said earlier, you know, um, you know my course, I hope it isn't, but you know, mainly for student recruitment, but my course, social, labor, social movements and development at SOAS, 
could probably be taught online in another country uh, who've got hold of our reading list. You know, you know I'm, I'm, I'm not, I hope I'm a good lecturer, but I'm probably not the world's best. I'm sure there are other better. So, so this internationalization, the issues of copyright and all this, I think there are links there as well. So yeah, I think, yeah. Does that answer the question? Yeah, thank good. you. So, so perhaps one more question, if anybody has a question. Uh, hi, uh, I was wondering, like you mentioned in the uh, topic, like can you um, say more about how NGO laws in, in relation to the change of governing in China? Oh, right. Okay, thanks for that. Um, another, yeah, great question. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, in the last four years under, under the, the, the, the current China, government in China, there have been two important laws related to civil society, uh, uh, attempting to regulate civil society. One has been described the charities law in China, which is to regulate Chinese NGOs and what they can and can't do in China, what they can and can't research, what services they can and can't provide, what activities they can and can't do. Um, I think, you know, given the fact that civil society organizations in China exploded during the first decade of this century, that there, there, there probably was a need to bring some aspect of regulation to that. I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not a believer in laissez-faire economics or laissez-faire civil societies as well. I think regulation can bring order, can curb corruption, and all that kind of thing. Um, so uh, I, I think that law was, was, was kind of a, an enabling law to a certain extent. It was greeted with some intrepidation. To be more, uh, perhaps a more critical perspective of, of, of, that, of that charities law, looking at Chinese NGOs, was it was also uh, appeared to be an attempt to restrict NGOs, civil society organizations, to being service providers, not being organizers, not being campaigners, but to be service providers. And I think that links to the previous question about the global nature. Civil society is a global phenomenon, and there's no doubt that governments around the world, particularly China at the moment, wants to restrict civil society, generally speaking, to being service providers, to stepping in where the state has rolled back under the influence of, dare I say it, neoliberal thinking. Okay, so I think that's one aspect. Looking wide, and I think if we take that, if we look at then at the foreign, the management of foreign NGOs on, in mainland China, I think that kind of backs up that argument, really, because that puts quite severe restrictions on the abilities of foreign NGOs working in China to, to establish partnerships, to establish camp uh, you know, legal campaigns, to lobby hard. And, and one of the most worrying aspects of that is that it transfers supervision of NG foreign NGOs working in China from the Ministry of, uh, of, uh, the S Ministry of Civil Affairs to the police. And that's not really a very good message, I don't think. You know? I'm not saying the police are going to do it any... But it's not about the police. It's just not a good message. And, and, and it indeed has created, uh, I would say it's not an exagger exaggeration, say an atmosphere of fear of what the implications of this might be. If I'm an NGO, I'd much rather be monitored and evaluated and re by the Ministry of Civil Affairs than the police in any country. <laughs> thank you. All right. Well, um, let's say thank you to Tim, and we'll move on to Bangladesh next. So. And, and just Tim apologizes. He has to also leave a bit early. Okay, so, um, I, and I'm jumping up and down like a, a, a rabbit organizing the technology, and we have our next, um, Dawa Hussein from Edinburgh is going to be speaking to um, Shuchi, and I'm going to put her on the screen.
Yes, I see you. Um, yes. Um, uh, my name is Dawa Hussein. I'm a lecturer in the social anthropology department. Uh, before I um, uh, hand over to Su Chi, um, I'd like to put this talk into, into a little bit of context. Since 2013, and that date comes up again, um, since 2013, nearly 50 people have been targeted. Um, uh, nearly 50 people have been targeted and killed in Bangladesh by religious extremists aligned or sympathetic to the politics and worldview of Al Qaeda and ISIS. In the media, these killings have been described as or reported as blogger deaths, explained as the targeting of prominent activist bloggers who propose alternatives to the right-wing, conservative, political, social, <coughs> and economic agenda that sections of the Bangladeshi state and society are attracted to. What is less known is that it is not just bloggers that are on the hit list, an actual list of liberals, atheists, and people campaigning for human rights and, and more democracy. Zulhaz Manan, a friend of both Suchi and I, was killed in 2016. He was the founder of the first gay magazine in the country. But it's also academics who too have been targeted. Soon after Zulhaz's murder, Professor Rezaul Karim Siddiqui, an, uh, uh, a professor at Rajshahi University, was killed for apparently advocating for atheism. Suchi who um, we will hear from, left Bangladesh in 2016 um, and now lives in the Netherlands. In fact, I wasn't sure if we should mention that you're in the Netherlands. Um, uh, but uh, So Dr. Suchi Karim is a Bangladeshi feminist researcher, academic, development worker, and an activist. She has been in the, working in the field of gender, education, and development since 1996 and has been teaching at the tertiary level since 2000. Her specialization includes gender, sexuality, sexual and reproductive health rights, adolescents and youth health, uh, women's empowerment, sexuality rights, and social movements. Currently, she is a gender <laughs> um, Suchi, um, could you maybe start off by telling us a, a little, uh, generally, what, uh, uh, about the experience of being an academic in Bangladesh? Um, being a woman, being a liberal, <coughs> um, teaching the subjects that you teach in the backdrop of increasing fear and violence um, that is, that, that's quite apparent there at the moment. All right. Uh, you know, um, I, I need to make a correction that in the introduction on um, the live stream, I'm introduced as Brack University. I've been with them for a long time, but I don't represent them anymore because I left uh, Brack and I'm now, you know, living in the land. So whatever I say, that only represents me and my own opinion, and not uh, my previous uh, employers. Um, give a bit of a context. Uh, you know, I was born uh, right after the Liberation War in 1971, around 73. So I grew up at a time when Bangladesh had a very strong and long history of secular and liberal middle class culture. So I grew up in, in kind of, you know, aspiring middle class environment, schools that um, taught religion, but, you know, everything else, values, solidarity, all the liberal things that you can think about the most important um, characteristic that we grew up with. Politics was changing, it was getting more religious, but it never actually um, kind of interfered much with this democratic and liberal um, um, progress that the country was heading to. So I entered um, my education uh, and uh, you know, life uh, uh, from a background where we were the first generation for women in our families, like, you know, middle class families, where norms like marriage, motherhood, they were made very flexible. And aspiration for a career 
for higher education, they were, you know, priorities. So that, there was a shift there, which has been reversed now in many parts of Bangladesh or South Asia. There's a regression on that. But um, I think my entry into academia came through development studies and, and, and feminist studies, actually. I started uh, my career as a development worker at a much earlier age with Brad in a gender and education program. And then um, I, I kept on studying in different, different kind of uh, education institute, from all girls schools to Catholic conferences to extremely leftist, liberal um, Indian university to Warwick in UK to the lands. So I, when I returned to Bangladesh, you know, and I kept on coming back to Bangladesh to work, to teach, I came with that kind of a mixed bag of diversity. And it was the right time for universities, new universities like Bragg, and also public universities like Tuck University, which had just started gender studies with the money of uh, Dutch, uh, you know, embassy and the government. So kind of, a, you know, outburst of all gender justice and mm. progressive agenda. So the timing was great in the early 2000s when I entered. Um, and, um, uh, and we were fortunate to work for mentors. You know, it's, I think in both institutions or state, it is the individual mentors and people, activists, feminists, who, who shaped how I was allowed to pursue academic career and the subjects that I did. I studied English literature like any good girl would, you know, respectable good girl would do, and then become a teacher because that's the safest pathway. Then just everything changed, and uh, I decided to gender studies and then sexuality as my focus. So when I started my PhD, um, uh, and I, I decided to work on heteronormativity and look at how the culture, middle class heteronormative culture was being constructed, and how that had, whether it had any link to the uh, development agenda of that time, which is the mid 2000, and, and it's important because that is the time when the LGBT movement or activism had just started to become visible. And why so? It's mainly because of internet and networking, but mostly it was a time when development donors started pushing the agenda to Bangladesh and many other countries. Mm -hmm. You have to also remember, it is the time when the US politics was changing. At one point, Obama comes, and you know the whole US policy was very pro-LGBT. So all the embassies, all the donors, they were very, very excited and they were trying to encourage visibility. And it became part of sexual and reproductive health and rights development agenda. And soon it became what you can call that, um, not a direct condition, but a clause to projects, mm -hmm. you know. And, and it is a time when um, you realize that Sexuality, sexuality rights, which is part of gender justice and diversity and identity politics, is becoming a bit murky because there is not much knowledge besides what is known as um, common sense or cultural norms, but no study or no academic evidence-based knowledge that could actually create a basis for interventions or even the activism itself. It went. Um, to the field or to the ground or the forefront based on a lot of zeal, a lot of global influence, but very little local connection at the time. And even the activists knew it. But what was the prior to the time was that make ourselves visible. And, and when I started the PhD uh, program, um, I, I, I documented, I, I went along the movement itself because of friends and networks and also my own investment in it as a scholar. Um, it, it, it reached a momentum too high, too soon, which made, I think, many of us, both scholars, activists, or scholar activists like myself, um, I, I would say very um, reckless, in a way, because we became so happy with this progressive agenda that finally all this could be talked about. I, I started uh, working uh, for uh, Brack University, which was very unique because it had academia, activism, and social movement all combined. So my own effort of uh, academic endeavors could align 
translated to the movement itself, so it became an ally to the movement. Mm -hmm. um, and and it, it, it gave a lot of leverage to everything that was happening at that time. But also, we, we taught, I had a lot of teaching, and I was teaching a lot of feminist courses mainly, because you don't have sexuality study. Children studies departments don't teach sexuality study or sexuality at all. It has always been taboo. It is never even included as a concept anywhere. Even in the introduction to gender, it is very difficult to talk about sexuality. But it was only in literature and feminist literature courses where you have five students and nobody bothers about what you're teaching. That's where you can go ahead. But also what happened was at the time that I found myself being very visible as a scholar because, because my PhD was the only one that looked at sexuality for its sake, not, not as part of the problem or anything, but to understand sexuality. And then because of the visibility and my alignment with the um, LGBT movement and sexual rights movement, um, I found my call and, and um, uh, I used to be uh, giving public lectures in private and public universities, um, which at times looked very good in my mind, and I thought that it was you know, my contribution and thing. But if I look back now, I don't regret it, but you know, I, I think academicians are often living on such ideal towers that, and, and because what we publish, what we write, uh, except for ourselves, nobody did. And so it is so much safer to have journal articles, and especially in English. And because in Bangladesh, English is not the first language. So actually, nobody reads, it's not even my parents. But the moment it is translated into a local language, a local um, discourse, everyone you know, is alarmed. The antennas are up. You are under the, you know, you're on the radar. You cannot hide anymore. So you become a, a problem, you become a trouble. Uh, you become something that has to be questioned. And it was the beginning of, um, you know, I think the, the mid of 2015 when the bloggers started getting killed. Um, because they had nothing to do with sexuality. They, they had something to do with these two courses, atheists, or some kind of scientific voice of truth. And I think we still did not see that it was coming towards the other part of this distant voices sexuality and, and, and human rights in general. Um, and, and I think that itself was um, a mistake and it's a lesson to learn. Um, because academicians like ourselves, we are never trained how to do self-care. And second is how to prepare when things, you know, when literally shit is the man. Uh, you don't know. You, you don't know how to um, protect yourself. You know, you prepare yourself. When my um, Arachnid's friends um, got killed last year, the beginning of last year, uh, we had known the risks for a month or so before that. Um, and um, the evening uh, the incident happened, I think time throws in a way. Um, we talk about repression. Repression is not only um, a systematic um, um, kind of a structure that comes from the state or some kind of a stakeholder. Uh, it can come from uh, an environment mm. where it just creates so much of hostility around you that you are forced to repress yourself. Very cool, this one. And you know, you censor yourself and you try to you know keep low for a while. That is tragedy. And that's what has happened. And I think um, as an academician, as a researcher, I always thought that you know uh, anything you learn, you theory, theorize things. That really don't make much sense if no one understands it mm -hmm. and it has no impact on real people's life. I mean, you can, it's great to go to conferences and say things. But actually, in, um, what is the use of producing knowledge? What is knowledge all about if, if it doesn't have an audience that, that understands it and doesn't have a bigger audience that can, you know, engage use with it for, for its benefit? Mm -hmm. and, and I think it has been a very difficult um, time because when I, when I started um, researching on sexuality, um, uh, I think a very handful of people were excited, thrilled, um, uh, a few were amused, and most were very disturbed. Um, and also because, you know, who do you become as a person in 
influences how people perceive what you study and what you do. To me, being of a particular age, of a middle class background, not being married, not having children, and also studying sexuality is a very, very disturbing thought. And it creates a lot of pressure on myself and my family. And then when you feel so threatened for what you you present or what you produce as knowledge and what you want to do in life as part of your activism, um, it's not only about you, but your loved ones, and you want to protect them. And then, therefore, you know, I would say, I find the word anxiety, you know, repression very depressing because I try to think that these are temporary, um, you know, time frames, and I would say that um, this is a distance one keeps geographically to reorganize and recollect oneself and re-strategize. And that's what uh, I think uh, my current <laughs> mode of work is. Uh, without um, losing, uh, you know, uh, sadly, uh, but the, the, I think the downside of, of any kind of temporary, even temporary depression is that if you're removed from the ground where you were comfortable and working or you want to work for, it becomes distant, and there's a chance that you lose touch of that because all the other activists are are active in other <laughs> around Europe or in, in you know different countries. So it is it is very um, difficult, uh, but it also opens up um, some possibility <coughs> transnational activism, you know, and and try to understand that can you take on an agenda however controversial or taboo or difficult it is, uh, or it might be, without actually knowing enough about the context. If there is no local knowledge that has been prepared, jumping into a, a kind of an agenda is always uh, difficult. The last thing I want to say that, you know, um, the, the, the lack of uh, awareness from the from academician. I, and I was, you know, I was, I was so happy <coughs> giving lectures on sexual rights and women's sexuality, how important it is to do this and that. These are super valuable ones, and it's very difficult to speak in Bengali in this subject. So I thought that, you know, I, I actually mastered that. But then I also realized that I didn't know who was in my audience. Because right after I left Bangladesh, um, the Holy Artisan Cafe attack happened, and, and um, we realized all the uh, attackers um, radicalized young people came from the universities where I teach. They, they are a part of my student group. I have had students now um, who um, have come to Raqqa to work, you know, fight for ISIS. And there, there is this pretty late realization by the government of everyone that it is the urban privileged youth who go to universities and higher education that are more radicalized and those are the super cells. Those are the people who are reacting against, you know, all these things. Mm. And so it is very difficult to be, I think, a teacher um, or or um, or a researcher at this moment because um, in these subjects, I don't know how long this is going to last because the government takes a very very cautious uh, step and and a, and a standpoint. Especially when the killings happened, they refused to acknowledge that it was LGBT activists. They said it was a political murder, and, and the backlash against LGBT activists were murdered. Uh, the brutality was condemned, but not the reason for the murder. That was a you know wake up call. How deep-rooted um, this anti this homophobia is, or anti-women sentiments are. Um, so these are very difficult times to trade because um, the gender index Bangladesh is doing super, mm. the current period is doing very well, and then you see all this, mm. um, you know, um, little fringes where it doesn't, you know, go anywhere, and you try to figure out how do I come in this and make any sense of it. Thanks, Suchi. Can, um, let's stop there because I think the audience might have some questions um, at this stage. Any questions? Comments. 
Uh, thank you for your talk. Can you, can you hear me? Okay. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, you were saying that it, there's a necessity then to make it more, more local and to make it understandable by local communities. You know, how, how do you as an activist then go about that? Especially, you, you know, I know you're reluctant to stay in exile, but while living abroad, what, what do you think's next, essentially? On a very basic question. I couldn't hear oh, okay. uh, Do you want to maybe re-articulate? <laughs> Um, so, um, so what's next? I suppose. What, yeah. So, what what do you do? Yes. So what do you I'm thinking around with the local. Yeah. I think the first few months uh, went into um, just getting out of a trauma. Um, I think we undermine how long it takes to actually um, bring yourself back to a functional life. Um, you know, it, it's it's extremely difficult. It's more difficult than I can understand. To be, um, uh, your mobility is restricted and your you know your plans are restricted. But what it um, what academia also gives you is privilege, extreme privilege, uh, because of um, the networks you're in. And academia has a tendency to protect its own people, unlike many other <laughs> you know um, areas of life. I think it, it does make a very um, um, you know, strong case for. I, I you know I, I studied in the Netherlands, and um, um, and um, this this country has you know, immediately uh, because of my university connections and my uh, fellow activists and feminist friends, they immediately brought me in and, and made sure that I could continue with my work. So what I do now is I am trying to um, uh, document. Uh, what has happened since then, and how uh, you know, I, we can analyze, uh, look back, be reflexive, and, and, and then look into social movements, and what fails in these changing times, uh, where different um, um, power um, shareholders uh, play different roles. What looks innocent in the beginning as well-intentioned, like donor money and that kind of things, how actually is counterproductive it can be and how harmful that it, can, that it can be if you do not know what politics is being played. Why people don't take any risk assessment to the beginning of a project or who takes accountability of the consequences that happens, you know. When, when the king starts, you know, if you're a donor, if you're a foreigner, you can just pull out. You just can't leave the country. Leaving the front runner is actually very vulnerable. So I think my my current um, uh, interest is to reflect and look back on um, this really, really uh, troubled um, uh, uh, sort of ground for development and activism and scholar activism and how all these, um, you know, actors come together um, and then uh, do not find any uh, cohesiveness in them and therefore it fails the cause itself. Um, so I'm, I'm trying, I'm being very critical. I'm not being cynical, but I'm being very critical because I think I played a role in it um, without understanding the, um, the gravity of it or understanding what uh, long-term impact it might have on all of us. Yes, Hello, can you hear me? Well, wow, that's very loud. <laughs> uh, thanks, that was a re really interesting talk. My, my question kind of follows on, I think, from your answer to the last question, which is, how do you think, in, in this kind of, this kind of uh, uh, tripartite or this of, of transnational movement, academic work and local activists, how can, how can we build on that to both promote academic freedom, the notion of academic citizenship, but also the very, you know, to overcome the very real challenges that you so eloquently described. What, you know, what, what can we do? And, uh, you know, I th I'm sure it, it varies according to each, each context, but I'd be very interested in to know how, how you think we can build on that in, in the context that you're coming from. I just mentioned that I'm not going to be cynical, but I think there is a <laughs> cynicism in me because I find it very frustrating, you know, in the current um, situation. In the context of Bangladesh, if I'm being very precise, I think the next few years will be basic survival for the activists. 
they are trying to literally save themselves and find safe grounds while reconnecting. What becomes very important, and we talk to each other very often, I have, I've just finished interviewing uh, quite a few of them, it's about, you know, preparedness. <coughs> so is, there has to be some kind of um, knowledge and training and networking where um, experiences from similar backgrounds that happened earlier has to be brought together um, with the you know, current activist experiences and, and teach how do you organize yourselves again when everything falls apart. Um, uh, there will be, I, I can guarantee you, there will be no sexuality rights and activism in Bangladesh or in many of, you know, say Turkey or Egypt in current, you know, month. Uh, it will be extremely difficult. Uh, um, uh, it, it will not be able to organize itself again. Transgender rights, yes, it still exists because it's it's a different, you know, uh, actor there. Um, but I think it is so important for um, uh, different human rights, um, you know, activists and scholars trying to get um, this scattered people together and, and, and actually help them to um, understand um, and re-strategize. I think that's the only thing that can be done in my mind in, in, in the next few years. Uh, because, you know, uh, however much your own um, conviction might be to take forward a cause, when I, I, I know my friends who are in, say, Sweden or Germany, and, and they're just stuck. Uh, you know, they will wait years to get their papers uh, from, you know, for asylum, asylum uh, status. They cannot work anywhere. They were really, really established people. Your career is ended. You cannot go back. Your parents are on deathbeds and you cannot go. And, and there is no income. There is no stability. I think it, it's, it's a lot of expectations that these people will let go of all this and then, you know, do something very constructive immediately. I think it is a very, it has to be addressed from a very human perspective um, that looks into the human realities of activism and scholar activism and what, what it means um, to be these identities. Um, I think that, that understanding is lack in, in current. Thank you. have to move on, but let's thank um, Suchi for joining us. She'll join us again <laughs> later. Yes, um, so Suchi was, is joining the live stream and she'll rejoin us on Skype um, in the final discussion um, section. So now we have two, two um, uh, speakers on Uganda, who are present in the room. Um, will you please come and join us? Yes, hi everyone. Thanks for staying late into the evening on a Thursday. Um, it's a total privilege to be here and I feel I'm quite humbled to be speaking from a position of extreme um, security and and uh, job security and you know um, physical security compared to some of the issues that we're talking about. It's quite emotionally affecting, I think, to hear um, both firsthand and sort of second and third hand stories. So, Sophia, thank you for organizing and thank you for inviting us. Um, I'm Zoe Marks, I'm the director of the Global Development Academy and I'm also the director of our African Studies Master's Program. I'm a political scientist by training based here in the Center of African Studies. And I'm going to um, speak briefly about, I've actually I've brought my phone to just keep an eye on the time, <laughs> it's brief is always relative. I'm going to speak briefly about some of the issues that um, colleagues of mine had faced in Uganda in the first instance, but also some of the issues that have arisen in my own collaborative research in Congo and um, some of the work that I've done with colleagues in South Africa around building sort of transnational solidarity in a regional context. Um, so 
I think one of the things that I was struck by listening to the earlier speakers is that it is really challenging to know what solidarity actually means in practice when the rubber hits the road. Um, I think it's striking how individuals are targeted by systems of oppression and by repressive apparatuses, and that can really fragment our attempts to build solidarity. It's much easier to think of solidarity when your solidarity exists in the context of collective action. Um, but the stories that came to mind when I was thinking about my comments are, are very much about how individuals have been sort of singled out and pulled out of the, the sort of flock, if you will, and how difficult it can be to kind of convene as, as colleagues, um, particularly in international perspective, but also sort of locally and within national contexts. Um, so I'll begin with the, the story of my friend and colleague, Stalin Yanzi, who was a research fellow at Makare University. Um, and she's, she's a very, very vocal feminist political activist in Uganda, in Kampala. And she was targeted for comments that she made on social media um, as a private citizen holding the first lady to account for promises that she'd made as part of a presidential campaign. So she was asking a political representative to provide the much promised and lauded sanitary napkins to keep girls in school. And her comments were seen as being inappropriate. And then um, she was under police surveillance. She was attacked. And ultimately, she was arrested and imprisoned um, for a couple of months. And she had also participated in a writing workshop that I organized last December with colleagues at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. And um, one of the things that we were trying to figure out as this existing network of transnational feminist scholars who had mobilized because everyone was doing politically engaged work, even though we had come together on that sort of pretext, we still found ourselves with very few options to support Stella. She's a prominent human rights activist and a prominent sort of outspoken academic activist in Uganda. So she had legal counsel, um, but she was in the face of a very clearly personalistic political targeting. And there wasn't a lot that we could do besides communicating with our colleague who was on the ground with her, you know, organizing letters of solidarity, trying to keep tabs on the case. And at the end of the day, when somebody is in prison, I think it's really hard to figure out what solidarity looks like. And it's easy, I think, um, to occasionally slip into a sort of hubristic sense of an ability to change the situation um, because we have academic freedom. And, and I found myself quite frustrated and, and disappointed by my lack of options. And I think that was a sort of collective feeling that we all had. Um, one of my other collaborators at that workshop has had similar um, experiences of being sort of singled out, but hers have come not from the state, but rather because she's a, a queer, lesbian, feminist scholar who has decided to focus her activism at the local level. So instead of focusing on um, sort of political speech acts in digital spaces that were highly visible to the Ugandan government, like Stella, um, this colleague worked in local communities where some of her friends and sort of research associates were being targeted for being suspected lesbians, visible lesbians in townships in, in Cape Town, South Africa. And so her challenges, rather than imprisonment and persecution by the state, have been you know, how you can continue to do your work when the community that you research is being persecuted and you're being persecuted for your own identity as being of that community and sort of um, trying to give voice to those experiences. And I think what I saw in both cases was a, a total lack of support from the institutions that they're affiliated with academically um, and also a, a fragmentation of colleague support. And I think that this is something that happens in protracted contexts of academic persecution, where the persecution almost falls behind the scenes in many African countries. And it happened sometimes decades ago. But the knock-on effects of sort of lower grade self-censorship, um, selective hiring processes, denial of resources, have created an environment where it's so resource deprived in some universities that the act of speaking out, of trying to generate political solidarity amongst colleagues who are doing activist research becomes quite threatening to academics' livelihoods. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that has really stunted um, 
some of the opportunities to build solidarity um, in African higher education institutions. I want to pivot for a moment and talk about um, other realms of, of academic freedom and, and sort of citizenship in the global perspective through an African context. And, and I'm working currently with a research project that's multi-sided in Sierra Leone and in Eastern Congo. And one of the challenges that we've had with our research assistants and enumerators on the team in, in Eastern Congo, and this has affected a number of projects in Eastern Congo, is that as a conflict affected context, it's really difficult to provide recognition for academics' work. People often don't want their names to be attributed on um, research reports, on consultancy reports even. And that has knock-on effects for the types of research that we value, particularly in the UK. So the ways that um, sort of global challenge-oriented research and ref-oriented research is supposed to drive impact, it's supposed to have stakeholder engagement, you're supposed to have capacity building, all of these boxes that we think we ought to tick as a way of being good ethical partners and collaborators in research don't always work in repressive contexts where people documenting information, particularly about violence and conflict and inequality, can get them harmed by political actors and economic actors in their local communities. So I'm interested in hearing more from people who are here tonight about the ways that both local and cross-national mobility can really constrain academic freedom. Mm -hmm. It can constrain opportunities for attributing research appropriately to the collaborators that we're working with, and that's not just within formal institutions, but also with regards to research assistance. And it can really limit, um, for my Congolese colleagues, it can really limit the degree to which they want to be engaged in, in sort of impact, in policy impact. To take the information to policymakers isn't really an option for them because that would suggest that they had to own the information, they had to say that the message was one that they were willing to risk their lives and their family security for. And, and honestly, they, they want to do research, but they want to do research because they like to do research and to get paid and feed their families, right? That's not, it's not a sort of existential cause for them. It's very much part of this broader research economy and an ecosystem of knowledge production mm -hmm. in which their agenda was, was never at the sort of the top of, of what the research questions were. Um, the last couple of things I wanted to say quickly, just to raise a few other kind of key issues in closing. I do think that self-censorship um, is really hard to assess, particularly with our colleagues in Africa. So it's hard to know how much isn't being said because people are choosing not to say it. It's that kind of counterfactual of, you can sort of see persecution when there's a rupture in the political space. But when it's sort of decades of of preferential hiring practices and resource erosion and kind of manipulation of, of budgets and salaries, co-optation into political parties can silence academic debate, um, the sort of deliberate exclusion and silencing of individual voices can set an example for others and we don't have a lot of good data or information about this. Um, there's some questions to be raised in African universities around student freedom of speech and the way that patronage politics come into the classroom so that, that people have to sort of perform particular opinions in order to get a passing grade, in order to do well, in order to get scholarship opportunities. Those are often very sort of politically managed in, um, in sub-Saharan Africa. And then I think most importantly, it can't be, none of these issues can be delinked from the way that poverty and the colonial history, which Sarah Jane will talk about a little bit more, have sort of systematically for the past um, 30 years in particular deprioritized African intellectual contributions. Mm -hmm. So the climate during the Cold War was very different and there was a real premium on intellectual exchange as part of the political project of consolidating power in the West or um, in the sort of Soviet realm. And that's, that's really changed since 1990. So in 1990, there was this Kampala Declaration by the Council for the Development <coughs> of Social Science Research in Africa, Codestria. And it does this amazing job of connecting intellectual freedom with social responsibility in a way that I think is um, a particularly African 
linking of, of responsibility and liberty, right? That there's a, there's a collective endeavor that's really clearly articulated in that. Um, but what we've also seen is that in response to that collective endeavor is a much more informal gatekeeping of Western dominated Eurocentric knowledge production about the continent. And so I've done quite a bit of research recently on the ways that that gatekeeping manifests that I'd be happy to talk about, but that's the soft version of academic freedom mm -hmm. where we see voices being excluded in, in not overtly repressive ways and not even by national governments, but by the academy that we're sitting in today. Mm -hmm. So in closing, I would say that um, I think there's only ever as much space as exists locally. If local researchers can't claim their own ideas, then we're not actually providing the solidarity that we'd like to. Um, and I think it's essential to think about our responsibilities. You know, as James framed the opening, we have responsibilities at the University of Edinburgh, but those responsibilities don't stop with creating opportunities here for people to find safe haven. They extend to the work that we do in the field and creating sort of zones of, of safety and security that actually open space and open the sort of protected opportunities mm -hmm. for speech and recognition of our academic colleagues. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I think Zoe has done a fantastic and comprehensive job of, of, of exploring these kind of issues. And I, I want to get us onto the questions, not least because I want you to ask Zoe about her recent research, which I think is really important and timely. Um, but I think, I think we can just kind of just drawing this out into the South African context, um, which is where I've done um, it, the, the country in which I've done a lot of research, although my research hasn't explicitly been on higher education, um, I think we can see what kind of you were drawing out in the pedestrian statement um, and in that kind of dawn of it, a new post-Cold uh, War era. We can see those various trajectories meeting in really important ways, and but also ways that are really tangibly shifting over time. And I think one of the really important things around this is our constant reassessment of the ways in which incremental and as well as larger structural battles are shifting the terrains of academic freedoms in ways that we need to constantly assess what we're calling victory, what we're fighting for, uh, ways in which, and obviously um, in this context, that is integral into ways in which we're practicing and exploring uh, solidarity and building platforms and microphones that other people can use. Um, so I think, you know, if we're looking at the cadastral statements and specifically around how it's really grounded in this idea that academic freedom is curtailed by structural uh, forces that are what they call historically produced and, and persistent, which I think is a really excellent way of kind of exploring this. We can look at how they're meeting currently in the South African context, and we can look at it at several fronts, and this is in no way exhaustive because I'm going to try and cover it in 90 seconds so we can get onto, onto some questions. But I think we can look at the way in which we have these acts of uh, a state control and con creeping and different ways in which the state is trying to capture agendas to expand freedom and actually shut down space both in the present and the future. And in the South African context, we've seen that in the 2013 oversight committee that put Professor Makoba in, in charge of kind of the, exploring the transformation agenda and how this was going to be implemented, as well as the 2012 um, uh, amendment to the Higher Education Act, which gave Bladen Izamande, um, who's the education, higher education minister, um, new and important and vague and extended freedoms into um, the control of university spaces in ways that were putatively framed as being um, able to push forward transformation, but if anyone's been following Blade's statements around students and the student protests in Thieves Must Fall and Rose Must Fall, you would be healthily skeptical and rightly uh, kind of wary about what exactly these, um, these powers were going to be utilized for. So of course the state is an important facet in this kind of picture, but I think as Zoe was really powerfully demonstrating, we would be incredibly lax if we were, were finishing there. The fees must fall protests that came out in South Africa uh, in 2015 were giving a really important kind of picture of the economic access issues that are surrounding uh, academic freedom. So if we're going to have an academy that is considered free, it needs to be openly accessible, meaningfully accessible, and people need to be able to stay on in that academy and progress and flourish. And obviously, economic barriers are incredibly important part of, of that. Um, there has been 
um, as has been showed by the, the reoccurring protests around that, there hasn't been a real um, substantive effort to tackle that at its root in South Africa. And in fact, when a lot of the protests were occurring uh, previously, there has been some legislation that was passing through that was worryingly extending the degree to which private institutions might be able to act in increasing terms in public academy spaces, which I think is again something we need to watch in the South African context as well as elsewhere in the future. And also the ways in which in response to those fees was for protests and the rose was for protests, which we'll come on to in a second, there's been an extension of blending, blended um, learning in the uh, South African university space because essentially it enabled students to carry on learning even if the university space was shut down by protests. And so I think there's a really important way there in which online learning spaces has fragmented the capacity of a, a powerful collective action space in the public space, physical space of the academy uh, to have an overarching reach. If students um, and uh, lectures continue, can continue as a, in a kind of a business as usual sense, uh, despite massive uh, collective action within the public space of the university because of online blended learning, then I think we need to think about the ways in which we're thinking politically around uh, these new learning spaces and what collective action might look like around and within them. But finally, I think it's a really uh, crucial uh, to address the ways in which uh, racism has been closing academic space, uh, academic freedom in South Africa, persistently, historically, and also kind of um, currently in ways that are being uh, challenged, but in ways that continue to be reinforced at an institutional level. So many of the kind of... Um, Coming through towards the end of apartheid, many of the ideas of defense of academic freedom were focused on so-called open universities that were able to kind of push back on the apartheid legislation that was regulating racialized space. Now, of course, uh, the whole, whole idea of what an open university uh, is and could be has been wholly challenged in uh, post-apartheid South Africa recently. We've got a constitution in South Africa that, has, that protects individual rights to academic freedom. But I think as the Rhodes Must Fall process have really powerfully shown, the individualized liberal defense of academic freedom doesn't uh, means far more limited things when it comes up, up against the structural persistent oppression of uh, racism and other intersecting oppressions. And so I think um, a, a professor of sociology, Kulela Mangu, has said really importantly in this, um, uh, the debates and discussions around Roads Must Fall, um, that, that in some ways this, um, the, the question of economic access <laughs> has sometimes been used in South Africa to distract from the persistent and ongoing questions of, um, of race and racism in the university. And I'll end with his words, no amount of talk about economic disadvantage will ever capture racism as a psychological and cultural assault on black people as individuals, students, and parts of the community in the academy. And his idea is that until um, uh, black students in South Africa are able to be welcomed into an academic space, to feel free within that space, to be able to meaningfully be heard and progress and flourish within that space, then any kind of talk of uh, liberally defended, individuated academic freedom is, um, is uh, not completely meaningless, then substantively challenged. Right, so we have some time for questions, and I did a terrible job as a um, moderator in not introducing <laughs> Esther and Cooper Nock, and then she forgot to introduce herself too. So, but, um, so questions for Zoe and Esther. Thanks uh, for your insights um, from Africa. Um, I'm not, I haven't been there much, but I once did go to um, Sudan and Ethiopia, and these are, I think, environments where you have these, these issues as well. But actually, I remember especially University of Khartoum as a place where, compared to the rest of society, there's quite a high level of, of freedom. And actually, it was there that we could have debates that we couldn't have anywhere else in the country, or at least in the city. So I'm curious if you want to just oppose what the kind of descriptions you just gave with, you know, the other 
flip side, if you like, or maybe like a, the academy as as a host uh, for for formulation of, of free thought, um, if no more, and and maybe not. Maybe, I mean, there's a while ago. Maybe that has changed. You know, maybe it's gotten um, worse since. Since um, yeah, we did mention earlier how, how it did get worse everywhere, including in this country. Mm. Do you want to start? So I take no, no, okay. Okay. Well, I'm just gonna right off the bat. Like I know almost nothing about the higher education discursive environment in Sudan. Mm -hmm. um, but on the on the chance that I've misrepresented academic freedom in Africa, I think that there's, it's important to understand that um, universities across sub-Saharan Africa in particular, but also North Africa, have been really integral to political debates, mm -hmm. and they've been huge sites of political mobilization, party politics. Um, you know, in the, in the 1970s and 1980s, when there were coups and military interventions, the university was an important site of political purges, specifically because there's so much political discussion and debate and research that was happening. Um, so I, I don't think it's, it's surprising to hear that in Khartoum you found that there was actually a huge amount of sort of discursive space. Um, I guess the, the practices that, that I find most worrying and that my colleagues have talked to me about um, from Nigeria to Kenya, Uganda, is this idea that the way people are selected into positions now, the hiring practices, have, have become, in many cases, very politically biased. And I think that that has a tendency to, to dilute um, academic discourse from behind the scenes. Is it a new thing, or was it always like that? In terms of the, the self-centering that's going on. No, the, the hiring the practices. Hiring practices. Right. So that actually reminds me of like centuries of tradition in European universities. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, and, and institutions. Yeah. Yeah. I think when you, when you have institutional diversity, it's mm -hmm. common for institutions to have sort of self-selection or one gets a political rep reputation. A number of African countries, because of the legacies of how their higher education landscapes have been constructed, have one really prominent university. Mm -hmm. Nigeria is a really prominent exception to this rule because they have several, Ghana has a few, so it's not that it's every country is the same, but I do think that there are fewer top universities in African countries, and so that means that if there's political monopolization of discursive space, then it, it just has a stultifying effect across the sort of potential of that academic milieu across the country. Do, is it new? Do you, I mean, do you want to jump in? Well, I just think I just think it's um, it, it's, there is a fundamental. I mean, of course, to some sort of some degree, there is historical trajectories to all of this, but like I think it's useful to go back to what Zoe was saying about you know these bigger questions being essentially grounded in a very localized political space as well as a broader national political space. Yeah. So, in in that sense, if we're looking, there's, there's there's the temporal trajectories across the continent are so diverse, right? In terms of the the shifts and the contestations around the opening and closing of democratic space in very particular ways. And then the ways in which that's localized around particular sites, you know, and, and we can talk more broadly there about urban and rural kind of grounded universities. We could talk about um, how universities access in the university rankings kind of affects uh, the ability of voice and to be listened to. We could talk about the degrees and the disciplines that are particularly being sites of expansion and contraction. And I think once you start layering all of these things mm -hmm. on, you know, in, in a way, yeah, there's, there's been important historical trajectories. Is there one big picture? I, I don't think so. Um, but, there's, yeah. but I think there's um, the, the hiring practices you think you need to look at. And in really important ways that the, like the key vice chancellors have had really important impacts in certainly in the South African context, I think, in terms of the, the resources um, allocation that goes behind hiring practices as well. So the potential where for, for hiring at, at particular points. There, yeah, there's huge variation across the continent. I mean, there's, in the country that I've spent the most time working in, in Sierra Leone, which was once known as the Athens of West Africa, we don't have purges where professors are being disappeared in the middle of the night and their bodies are found months later. I mean, that, that time has ended, but the, the sort of most preeminent scholar from Fort Bay College has written an op-ed a couple of years ago saying that you know the university is totally 
defunct and he's no longer going to work there because it's been rendered so politically inert mm -hmm. through the deprivation of resources. In Tanzania, a totally different approach has almost yeah. created the same effect because you've taken top academics and incorporated them into what's basically a populist regime under Magafuli. And so that's another way of, I think, silencing the potential for thought leadership to really transform politics rather than party politics to transform the university. I guess that's mm -hmm. the distinction I'm trying to draw. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the question. Um, I wonder if the, we at this point need to make a distinction between universities and people who learn at universities and people who teach at universities. Mm -hmm. Because often, and we can see this not just in this country, but all across Africa, but also uh, across Asia, th the university agenda is a very different agenda to the people who people it. And um, so, you know, in, in the South African case, the universities don't support, as an institution, they don't support the movement. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in Suchi's case, it was Suchi who um, went to teach uh, uh, gender and sexuality uh, classes in poor schools, poor colleges, in public universities. And then when she finds herself in trouble, the university is not supporting her. Mm -hmm. It's her who's in trouble, and it is her family who then have to, and herself who have to bear the mm -hmm. brunt of that. Mm -hmm. And she doesn't want to talk about being in exile, but she finds herself in exile. And, you know, the university continues doing what the university does. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder if, if we accept that, then what... So solidarity, how does that work then? Mm -hmm. um, is it... Are we just... Are we these atoms, these balls behind us, mm -hmm. who are kind of latching onto other balls? Um, you know, I think... we Do we still live in the days when... Uh, universities shut down to support causes in other universities. We mm -hmm. something that factories did and other sorts mm -hmm. of workplaces. If those workplaces no longer do that sort of thing, then you know, of course, we don't do that sort of thing any longer mm -hmm. either. Yeah, I think it's really important, and I think it, again, it's really interesting to see where moments of solidarity are. Where, so, for example, the um, there's been there's, there have been also individual staff who have been supporting the fees must fall and the roads must fall movements, and of course they have then come under attack in really important ways as well. Um, it's interesting the roads must fall case that then we had this kind of transnational effect of the roads must fall protests that were happening across the globe. But I think that was almost stronger, I would say, as an echo effect than it was necessarily as a, a, a moment of, of solidarity that could really change the prospects of individuals within those particular universities who found themselves excluded or were unable to kind of continue um, their studies. I think that another kind of pernicious thing that occurs as well is the ways in which um, the attacks on individuals are reframed in technical terms, right? So that everyone knows someone's getting pushed out for a political reason, but there's kind of technocratic reasons that kind of come around that. And um, and this is blended, I think, with um, a particular pernicious form of racism in South Africa where you've seen um, people like uh, William Makoba when he came into WITS, but um, more recently, uh, Professor Pakeng, who've had their qualifications challenged, right? So there's been this allegation that, and th this isn't necessarily because they've made a, a political maneuver, but this is this is also a way in which exclusion is kind of reproducing themselves. If people are being seen as kind of um, disruptive or framed as disruptive, even if they are not necessarily being so, this kind of idea, oh, well, you faked your CV. And this isn't actually a real qualification. And people being kind of dragged through that kind of uh, process as well. So I think it's, I think so that solidarity is difficult when the processes of repression are actively attempting to individuate people. And we saw that in South Africa in the fracturing of the student movement as well, like active attempts to individuate the student movement and to fragment it. Um, and I think it's particularly challenging as well when uh, a political 
um, uh, action gets reframed in some form of faux technocratic kind of issue, which is which it clearly never actually is, but it becomes harder then to to support it. But that said, I think there have been some really important instances in which people have coalesced in, in whether that's within particular departments across uh, divides of employment or tenure um, or transnationally where there has been kind of that the stickiness that solidarity allows which is you know not necessarily a permanent but an important um, uh, move towards collectivity. Right, thank you Zoe and SJ. We could talk much more about all those themes, but we're going to move on to Turkey. Um, so we have um, a different speaker than on the poster. Um, uh, Dr. Sada Tekin was, um, had to deal with a family emergency at the last minute and so um, Clemens Hoffman from Sterling University is going to speak with, we're going to introduce our new speaker who it should be coming on the screen now and all right um, okay and can you okay. hear us oh and all right, so no sound. Can, can, can you speak now, Olga? Hello? Oops. Oh, now, now, now try. Can, can, no, I okay, still can't okay. hear you. No. Right. There was a magic button before. Does anybody know what was the button that got pressed before? So let's keep speaking so you'll know. Hello, can you speak? Oh, yeah, of, of course. course. Oh, okay. okay, there you go. <laughs> we hear awesome. them. Great. All right. Okay. Okay. Hi there. Hi, Olga. Hi, Olga. So, uh, yeah, I'm just going to briefly introduce uh, myself and, and Olga, and then uh, we'll move on to asking some questions. So, um, uh, as Sophia said, I work at Sterling University, international politics, but prior uh, to coming here, I held a position in Turkey, um, in Ankara myself, um, and um, for broadly speaking on post-Ottoman state formation and political ecology in the region. Um, now, um, I'm very happy to welcome now um, Dr. Olgan Selin Hünler, um, who received her PhD from Middle East Technical University also in Ankara in clinical psychology. Um, she's currently a Philip Schwartz Fellow um, at the University of Bremen at the Department of Social Anthropology and Cultural Studies. Um, and prior to that, crucially, she held a position um, as an assistant professor at Izmir University of Economics, um, where, um, like many others, she was forced to resign in 2016, and um, many of you may be aware that the context to that is um, a petition, um, so-called um, Academics for Peace, uh, signed a petition, we will not be party to this crime, that um, pointed out and clearly criticized some of the government operations in southeastern Turkey in the context of the Kurdish conflict, and um, encouraged all parties to come back to the negotiating table. Ever since then, they have, forced, uh, they have faced a series of repressive measures culminating just recently in the formulation um, of criminal indictments for the support of a terrorist organization. So, um, but I'm sure um, Olga can speak to that uh, with much more authority. So um, can you maybe uh, give us a brief context um, of, you know, what, what initiated the petition and maybe also why, um, why you decided to sign it in the first place and, and whether mm -hmm. that, obviously, I think very few people expected that kind of harsh reaction, um, but um, yeah, how, how you've been getting on since, basically. Okay. Um, first of all, I would like to thank all of you for um, this, organizing this event. It's a real privilege to be with this uh, inspiring activists and academics. 
Um, actually, today I have a very hard duty because uh, Sardar is um, supposed to be here, so I, I'm trying to do my best to uh, fill uh, for Sardar. Um, okay, first I would like to talk very briefly about the background information. As you mentioned, uh, this petition uh, came to life uh, in order to be to do something um, to at least to protest or um, to be able to talk about uh, the military operations uh, been going on in the Kurdish region of Turkey. And um, after the cancellation of the peace petition, um, the government declared a curfew and this curfew unfortunately caused people to live um, for a very long time without electricity, without gas, without um, any kind of um, access uh, to the medical help, uh, even for the civilians. So um, at the end of this curfew period, almost 100 civilians, including and mainly women, children and elderly people, uh, were killed on the streets and lost their lives. So under those circumstances, more than a thousand academics signed this petition, as you say, titled, uh, We Shall Not Be Part of This Crime. And with this petition, actually, we try to uh, make a demand to the Turkish government to stop uh, human rights violations in the region. And um, I think everybody is familiar with the story afterwards. Uh, President Erdogan had this uh, famous speech right after the bombing in Sultan Ahmed Square. Uh, and he denied the uh, human rights abuses, uh, and also he framed our declaration as a terrorist propaganda. And in that infamous speech, he also called academics as ignorant, uh, pseudo-intellectual, and colonialists. And uh, he called on educational and the legal institution to take action. Uh, and of course, they did it very happily and very voluntarily. Uh, so after the press release and after the speech, uh, public prosecutors in many cities uh, started investigations and um, they did these actions based on various articles of the Turkish penal code at the beginning and um, right after that searches were warranted for the offices and the houses of the academics and signatories were taken into custody in several cities, including the um, Bolu Düzce, Kocaeli, Bursa and so on. And since uh, 2016, more than uh, five signatories lost their job. Um, some of us lost their jobs before the uh, unsuccessful uh, or failed coup attempt and before the statutory decrease. Um, York and uh, universities started uh, disciplinary investigations. More than 500 investigations were carried out in that year period. Um, and also after the um, state of emergency, uh, almost 400 academics were discharged from um, their post, their positions with the statutory degrees, which means that at least in the near future, they have almost no chance to go back to their jobs and um, continue um, their previous works and duties. Um, it has been attracted a big international attention. Four of our friends were arrested. Uh, in 2006, uh, and they were kept in prison for more than a month. Uh, and all those things happened just because um, people signed a petition uh, which tried to attract attention to the peace. So very recent updates that um, signatory academics are sued uh, on an individual basis based on the accusation of uh, terrorism propaganda. And these uh, accusations uh, are continue according to the law on uh, struggle against terrorism, Article 7.2, um, which means that a public prosecutor proposes imprisonment uh, extending to 7.5 years. Um, again, it is just for signing the petition. And the number of academics who already received their um, indictments is increasing day by day. 
um, and the first trial will start on December 5th next week, is, which is very, very close. Um, there, there is actually one thing that attracts the attention of all of us. I assume that even though uh, the crime, in quotation marks, have been committed by um, 2,000 people, um, they started to continue this process on an individual basis. So rather than um, collecting us in the one case and try to um, the, the run this case against all of us, they are just selecting people one by one and uh, most likely they are trying to um, stay low profile and not attract the international attention mainly. So uh, from the very, very beginning, I believe that uh, we did a good job to establish a solidarity network. Uh, this network did not only uh, work in an international context, but also our friends and colleague, colleagues who are still in Turkey um, did a fantastic job, especially with the solidarity academies. Uh, the first solidarity academy uh, was formed in Kojeli in September 2016, if I'm not wrong, and uh, several others were followed. Um, the Kojeli uh, example, uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, right after Ankara Solidarity Academy were opened up, then Izmir and Eskişehir, Mersin, uh, Mardin and Dersim. So the very aim of the Solidarity Academics is uh, bringing together purged academics and um, as well as the people who are still trying to hold on to their positions uh, at the moment at the universities. Uh, most of the purge academics and solidarity uh, academies are the signatories of the peace petition but um, they are not just limited uh, to them but also they would like to host it um, all critical scientists or all researchers with some kind of critical stand or critical perspective. Um, so this solidarity academies also help academics to involve in informal um, knowledge production. So it was actually a very good experimentation, let me say. Um, to see that we are not bound by the institutions to be able to do research and spread the knowledge that we have. Um, right after the Solidarity Academy is established in Turkey, International Solidarity Academy is also uh, being set up uh, in Germany, France, United Kingdom, Australia, Netherlands, so on and so forth, also um, established those solidarity academies. Uh, we have a very broad informal network as well. So we are trying to be informed about each other, even on an individual basis. So it does not have to be um, purely academic or purely political, but also on a personal basis, we are trying to be in touch with each other. I believe this is a very important um, component, uh, especially in a times like this. Um, in Bremen University, I can give an example from here, uh, I think, because I'm very much involved um, in the context. We try to um, prepare a report and we presented it into Bremen University Senate last year. And in this report, we try to come up with some solid examples or solid uh, cases for them. Um, to be in solidarity with the colleagues in Turkey. And um, from the very beginning, including Professor Smith, the idea of partnership actually has been discussed. And um, Bremen University, for example, has many uh, partnership with the Turkish universities. So first thing we asked them to do was to uh, reevaluate their um, established connections because some of those universities were first in line to um, kick people out of the universities because of signing the petition. Um, also, we wanted them to uh, freeze their cooperations with the Turkish research body, TÜBİTAK and the Commission for Higher Education, because they were 
two of the biggest institutions actually um, who have a m massive role uh, in the purge of academics um, from their posts, from their positions. Also, we uh, ask them to think about some kind of um, honorary positions, even though um, they may, I mean, if, if, let me put it that way, if they have hard time to uh, fund the academics, uh, they may still be able to um, propose some kind of honorary positions. So by this way, especially for the uh, early career scientists, they will be able to continue their research and um, they could use, the, for example, library facilities or they will be able to have a university email account uh, which makes all these publication processes and the research processes much more easier um, rather than using a commercial um, email account, for example. And also, uh, for us, it was very important to support the applications of the PhD student because um, when they lost their position, uh, they did not only mm, lost their economic income, they also have uh, significant difficulties to pursue their PhD and uh, complete their higher education as well. Uh, so at this moment, I think it's very important and critical to talk about uh, what we can do to support our colleagues uh, in Turkey, especially the ones trapped in Turkey. Uh, with the statutory decrees and um, so many of our colleagues lost their passports, their passports are confiscated, but um, even people who still uh, work in, continue to work in their uh, positions may have a hard time to leave the country. So this is very much arbitrary process. You never know what's going to happen with your passport situation. So at the 5th of December, there will be the first um, peace petitioner will be on trial. Uh, I feel like I believe that it is um, greatly important to be able to uh, establish some kind of solidarity network um, with this court cases and the trials, maybe sending uh, observance or maybe in touch with the human rights organizations and put a pressure on them to observe the case in Istanbul um, could be very valuable. Of course, uh, supporting dismissed scholars financially is still very important because uh, even though we try to create a pool for friends who lost their positions with the labor unions, um, not everybody dismissed uh, could be member of the labor union because of the regulation academics in foundation universities, for example, are not allowed to be the part of the labor union. So um, being in solidarity economically makes so much sense. Uh, there are some international means um, to promote this, such as educational international account for Europe or you caring campaign. Um, in America are proper means uh, for this financial support. Um, also, trying to establish uh, a research options and work with Turkish colleagues who stuck in Turkey as a research collaborator, again, could be a good option um, to show the solidarity, international and academic solidarity. And, uh, of course, it's always valuable to share and spread the calls for solidarity, try to make it visible in the social media, or write an article about it and try to publish it um, in different means and mediums could be very um, valuable um, attempts at this moment. Um, I I think I can stop here, so maybe questions will be more um, promoting to go into the details of, of. Thanks, Olga. Yeah, Olga. So, any questions? Good evening. 
Um, I have a question. I'm kind of a little bit emotional on this. Can you, can you speak Hi. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Um, as the, as Olga was talking about uh, the coup attack in Turkey, and also, and uh, she mentioned it about 400 uh, academicians are being um, jailed in Turkey, if I understand correctly. But I have a numbers here, which is um, the, the community that I belong um, that was accused of being the, the coup attempt. Um, but the, the, really, I'm kind of emotional about this um, problem because I have a very good um, friends and families. They are jailed. We have a numbers of over 180, over uh, 1,200, uh, sorry. Uh, 120,000 people is detained, 666 babies are jailed, uh, 44,000 teachers are unemployed, and we have over uh, 3,000 people as, as they are in uh, Greece at the moment, uh, they are se uh, asylum seekers, and some families uh, in UK, about maybe over 1,000 families, and well, where would you put these people in uh, academic, um, uh, f free academics? And what would you, uh, I mean, where would you put this? I don't know if I, I explain myself correctly. I'm really um, struggling here. And what, what do you think about the old academics uh, as being accused of and jailed by, uh, accused uh, by the Turkish government, in in and they are being jail, jailed, or they have to run away from Turkey to save their families and themselves. And where would you put these people in academic, uh, free academics? I don't know. If, if, if, if. Um, Kalmas, if it is okay yeah. for you, can you please just summarize yeah. it? Because of the eco, I have, uh -huh. will have a hard time to yeah. follow the whole I'll, question. I'll, I'll try if you don't mind. Uh, so, so I think the the. I mean, obviously, the, the purge, the post-school purge goes much wider than, than the academics for peace, uh, which includes, of course, many other civil servants, um, teachers, um, yet, yet more academics, uh, many of them also already jailed. Um, so I guess the question was, how do you contextualize the, your struggle, um, the struggle of the academic, struggle of the academics for peace, um, with the, the, the wider kind of post-school um, environment of, of, of cracking down on, on uh, you know, almost all sectors of, of public life and, and, and the various people being targeted uh, by this. And if I can just add to that quickly, I'm also curious what the, the situation is, let's say, broadly speaking, in, in, in, in, in the academy regarding the post-coup uh, purges environment, because it strikes me as, as, you know, like, obviously we discussed so far, you know, like the, the, the academy is a place for political mobilization and so on, and you know, obviously this has been kind of cracked down upon to begin with, or from the get-go. Um, so I'm just wondering how you feel about colleagues who aren't, who are still in, there, in place, and, and what, because you talked, we talked a lot about the international solidarity that is there, but is there colleagues, let's say, that, that are not necessarily threatened by, by the purge or, or because they haven't signed, what kind of reactions do you get from, from the, the people that are you know, ostensibly safe? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, actually, I mean, I've been invited to this event to speak on ab about the academics for peace. So, um, but of course, uh, with the military coup, I don't think any other segments of the community or any kind of um, job or employment status are remain safe. Uh, if you think about the journalists and the prison. Uh, the numbers are really, really scary. If you just look at the people uh, who have been arrested just because of their uh, social media posts, for example, uh, are, are quite scary and threatening. Of course, um, after this failed coup attempt, so many teachers and so many uh, academics, including other civil servants, lost their position. and. Um, Unfortunately, uh, it's not very um, possible to see that kind of 
broaden or extended solidarity networks uh, when it comes to those um, people or friends or colleagues who lost their positions. Uh, I mean, we got together as an academics for peace because there is one thing uh, we have in common. We have uh, a desire, we have um, a call for peace. It doesn't matter where we come from politically or socially or um, scientifically or academic, it doesn't matter, but there is one thing at least which unites us. Um, unfortunately, it was very hard to see that kind of um, connections or, or solidarity uh, with other people who lost their jobs or positions. I mean, remember the hunger strike of two um, academics, a teacher and an and academic, Nuria and Semi. Uh, even uh, in their cases, it was very sad to see how few people actually be, be there and participate in the protest to support Nuria and Semi. Uh, so I, I, I think it's one of the important things that we have to um, think about it. When it comes to your other question about people who still be able to uh, continue their work, um, I think their reactions are very various. Of course, this is very anecdotal, uh, but um, some of my friends and some of my colleagues from the very beginning tried to be in touch with me and other people who signed the petition to support them, to encourage them uh, to be able to establish some kind of hum human communication. Just uh, forget about the rest. But so many of us actually um, experiences a huge um, personal and very, very massive um, negative emotional reactions. I mean, I know that some of our friends stopped talking to other people because of the political situation. Uh, they don't even bother to call or send an email or show any kind of um, solidarity with them. They try to pretend that there is a void on campus uh, when they encounter um, the peace academics as approaching. So, uh, so the, the reactions actually has been very much various, but I think it's always good to focus on the positive sides, focus on the successful uh, attempts of solidarity and um, like good reactions rather than stuck in on the um, unsuccessful ones. <laughs> okay. Any more questions? So, okay. Thanks very much. Um, I, I find it incredibly gratifying to hear that you've been able to maintain this um, solidarity between people who are targeted um, by Erdogan's government. And uh, particularly, um, I think we're all gratified by this idea of uh, the autonomous um, solidarity academies. Uh, which show a spirit of academia outside of the institution, <clears throat> which I think we all hope we would be, we would dare to do in case it was needed, or maybe it is needed uh, everywhere. And I was wondering, who are your students in, in these academies? Who are the students? Are, are, are the students following? Uh, are they coming on top of their regular studies? Uh, the students of the Solidarity Academy? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, the students are everybody, all public. Uh, those events are open and every ca everybody can join and participate. Uh, and actually it gives us um, a very good opportunities to be the students all over again. Uh, but of course, uh, Solidarity Academies has a certain uh, limits. They have some um, some boundaries for their action. And for example, there is almost nothing we can do to support the PhD student who has to uh, who has been kicked out of the program or 
um, who, whose thesis has been, the topic has been changed uh, by the department head. Or we don't have any chance to come up with a certificate program or to give some kind of diploma. For now, uh, in Germany, for example, there is a wonderful attempt called Off University. And they are trying to uh, put these open lectures, open courses in a more formal way, in a, in a formalized, institutionalized manner. And they are trying to be, establish some, some possibilities to offer either a certificate program and in the long run to offer uh, a diploma uh, following the graduation. So uh, it's not impossible, but for now it's not that easy either. Okay, um, are we moving to the big round table now? Or? Well, yes, we have a view in the front in the comments. Yeah, so, so we, we, we, we have a, you have a question, can you just? I would like to add something on it. All right, maybe you put, say yeah. it at the end, because right. we have one more part of our program. So Isabel and Mike, would you, sorry, you can't. Um, and I'm going to um, get Olga and um, thank you. Um, my name is Michael McKenzie. Uh, I'm a recent graduate of a master's program in the School of Social and Political Sciences. And, uh, well, I'm speaking, I'm one of the students um, who's involved in a, a BAC solidarity program, BAC being the Academics for Peace that we've just discussed. Now, I was going to, um, well, I was going to describe them, but they've been quite well described by um, Dr. Olga Hunler already. Um, just to repeat that, they have um, the trials coming up starting on the 5th of December. Um, they'll be tried individually. And uh, they've set out a, a call for solidarity. Um, and they're calling for foreign observers to stand, stand by them in the courts by sending monitoring teams, um, observers generating news, and through transparency and dissemin dissemination of information so, um, you know, that's something we can all do internationally. Uh, as for our, our own program for solidarity, we're focusing on PhD students. Uh, Dr. Hunler has spoken about that quite a bit, but just to give a bit more detail on what we're doing, here's uh, Dr. Isabel Darman. Yes, um, hello to everyone. Um, it's uh, it's a it's a very difficult day, um, perhaps because we're coming very close to the fifth of December when the trials are going to start. But for us here in Academics for Peace Edinburgh, it's it's a it's a ma magnificent day uh, because we we can announce a scheme um, that we've been working on for a year with the university, and maybe it will seem. Um, a huge time for perhaps not very much, but at the same time, symbolically, we think it's it's quite important. Uh, we were made aware that um, there is some solidarity taking place for the Academic for Peace signatories who are in post or who were in post through the Union uh, of Higher Education in Turkey. But very little, uh, as was said by Olga, very little um, can be done for supporting PhD students. And what we find really uh, incredibly uh, heartening is that people are trying to maintain a link to the academic community, even in this ordeal that they are going through. Uh, and we wanted, um, our, our solidarity group has organized various things, but we really wanted to support uh, the possibility of maintaining that link, at least to the international academic community. Uh, and that's why we've been working with the university um, and 
when I say the university, the university is concrete people. So we, we've had uh, very um, enthusiastic responses, uh, especially from the library. Um, and I'm going to mention names because um, it can look like it's an institution, but without these people, we would not be here today. So James Loxley, um, the convener of uh, Library and Information Strategy Committee, and Richard Battersby from the library. Uh, Fiona Mackay uh, from the School of Political, uh, Social and Political Science. Tony Dismore, the same school, Anna Drever, uh, Rupert Lesamore, who's the visiting student office person who is here, thanks. thank you for coming, and uh, Dorothy Mewing College. And of course, our group, Alistair, Clements, Derek, Dominic, Erden, Harriet, uh, Jamie, Jen, Mike, and Sophia um, uh, have been active on that. So, what have we done? We have uh, convince the university to create a remote visiting student status for up to a year uh, for, we hope, 20 uh, PhD students. That means that they will have a status as students, so they will have an email account, they will have access to the e-resources in the library, um, and they will be part of the virtual community of the university. Um, for people who are from the University of Edinburgh, I will say, it's real, it's on Euclid. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we're going to provide mentoring, so there will be mentors, particularly postgraduate students want to uh, carry out that role uh, to help uh, the, the beneficiaries of this scheme to obtain something more permanent because this is really a bridging scheme. We can't deliver degrees. We're just helping them uh, for a year um, to, yes, to maintain their research. And we uh, are going to offer supervision. Um, we have a list of supervisors who, who have enrolled voluntarily to, to provide that. So we're going to disseminate um, the news about this scheme and the application form and everything, uh, and of course the, the conditions, because we can't attend everyone, so we have to make some, some choices and we will make that clear. Uh, but we hope very much that this is just the beginning, that other universities are going to emulate that, that even other colleges in our university are going to em emulate that. Uh, and um, yes, we... We hope also to crowdfund for some students, but we're not there yet. So thank you. So, um, oh, so there may be now questions for on our scheme, general comments, Final questions. I'm going to just um, uh, let you field the questions and I'll get um, Suchi and um, Olga together on Skype. So. Okay, so please put up your hand if you have Well, yes. another question I would like to add something and the, the things is happening in Turkey and I would like to uh, I mean, uh, Dr. Olga, she, she explained very well uh, the situation in Turkey. Uh, and I'm, I'm from Turkey, by the way, but I have been living outside quite a long time. And I'm from the, the, the, the hometown where the, the Kurdish people are populated. And uh, the signing that peace agreement or the declaration, let's say, it's just a really big issue in Turkey especially when the, uh, the time when the Kurdish issue become very sensitive. <coughs> so it's really difficult uh, for that uh, academics, I think around 2000, uh, who signed that, uh, the peace declaration. They say that we are not uh, part of that crime. And then, uh, you know, I mean, t imagine, I mean, the political party, the Kurdish political party is right now in the number uh, in terms of number of parliament members, they are uh, the third party in uh, third, third party in the parliament, and their leader is in jail, 
and you are signing as some declaration which you are you know uh, saying something about the you know the government cannot kill the uh, Kurdish people or, or, or uh, the government cannot um, uh, let me say the uh, continue this operation without taking care of the human rights and this is I think like very uh, the basic job of all the academics as dr. Olga said that regardless the the background or the field you are studying and they really did a great job and uh, now they are paying for that one it's very difficult uh, in Turkey to uh, I mean they support some uh, rights when the, the issues come to the Kurdish people and uh, the but uh, I have a contact, uh, contact with my friends, and academics in Turkey, uh, especially the last coup, after the last coup attempt in Turkey it last year. Uh, I think around 15 or 17 university was closed down. And then around, uh, if I'm, I'm, maybe I'm wrong with the numbers, but around 20,000 academics were fired. And uh, I think more than one third of them right now they are in jail. And then I heard that the, uh, from the news, of course, they put uh, like 20 professor in uh, a room of seven people, for, for seven people in the jail. And then, I mean, that the room for just for the seven people, but they put 20 people inside, and that 20 of them are professors. And uh, I have a contact uh, from one associate professor from Istanbul Technical University in Electric and Electronic Department, and he has been living in a village in, uh, close to Izmir, uh, well, almost a year, and he has been looking a way to run to uh, the Greece. And then just, you know, it's really difficult. I think and last week, he just gave me a call. He said, pray for me. I said, what's wrong? He said, I'm going to go try to pass the border with his boat alone. Uh, well, he was good in, in I, I, I know he's good in swimming, but uh, it's a big challenge in the night time and in November, and you are trying to cross the sea, which, uh, at that road just last week, uh, two weeks ago, two weeks ago uh, one family was drawn and all the members were, uh, 95 of them was that, and many of them, you know, the Syrian and many of the people. I mean, it, think about one academics and uh, taking a uh, risk uh, to, you know, the, putting his life and the risk to pass the border and go to the Greece uh, without a single cent in their pocket, and I think the uh, well, uh, we should we should pay the more attention on the academics in Turkey. Uh, well, uh, and and I, I know one of them, a friend of mine, he was a student of my friend, basically, uh, reality, a PhD student. Right now, he's in Greece. I talked with him that day, uh, last week, and I said, what's the situation? And he said, he's, I said that I'm just trying to survive and trying to uh, uh, buy a document, illegal document, to uh, travel to the German. You know, I mean, how come the one academics come in the situation to buy uh, illegal documents to travel to German? in the Greece, he's in Greece, he passed, the, he, he explained me how he passed the border, uh, the difficulties he faced, and then, uh, you know, uh, they, they passed from the river, which is very dangerous river. And, uh, well, I, I, just, I, I just want to add what I had from my friends uh, in Turkey, and many of them uh, right now I know uh, several professors, uh, we work with them, we write a paper together. Uh, they are in jail, and as Dr. Olga said that, they scare to even have a contact uh, with their friends. And why? Because uh, if there is any problems came out, the problem is not just affecting one person, it's affecting whole family. So that's why the people, even they scare to give their names. 
so uh, th that's the situation what I know in Turkey, uh, you know, for the academics. So I just want to add these things to do what Dr. Olga said. Thank you. We're really out of time, but if anybody has any final comment, and I'm sorry we didn't end up having more time for open discussion, but it seems we covered a lot of ground and there was a lot of questions during the process, but if anybody has any final brief thought, um, please do speak up now. Yeah, I, I was just very impressed by uh, uh, Sushi's uh, talk um, and how she how she sounded the alarm bells on how we academics um, are not prepared uh, to think that we might be the the targets of political attacks, and we just imagine that we have some kind of protection when we know, and, and there I didn't agree with her when she talked about the ivory tower, because um, we are not in an ivory tower. I mean, all the, that was discussed before, all the, the, the processes that affect society affect us as well, and we are, we are completely, well, like a, a business in the university. Um, that's how it occurs here. But, um, but I, I do think we are not very well prepared, and I think this, uh, it takes education and it takes, um, yeah, probably solidarity with uh, academics who are being targeted at the moment uh, to realize that, um, okay, we're in a privileged position here in this moment, but things can change very, very rapidly. Yeah. So, w would either of you like to have a final word, um, Suchi or Olga. I know you both have to go and maybe you cannot hear us very well. But if you ha either of you have anything you want to add at this point or... Oh, oh, you... No sound, sorry. Sound. <laughs> uh, I couldn't hear anything because of the sound echoed, so I'm not sure whether there was a comment or a question. Okay, well, it was more a comment, but um, I think Isabel, if I could summarize very quickly, she said that your remarks really highlighted the fact that we are often not thinking so clearly about the potential of threats and that we need to be more aware of the of um, the environment that we are we're in, um, and that that change can happen very fast. I don't know if I, I summarize you well, but that that more kind of awareness of those kind of um, existential threats, as it were, but um, are, are is important, and she was saying she appreciated your remarks on that. Hmm. But, um, do either of you have anything you'd like to add as a final word? Um, um, you know, um, in today's time when you have social media and it helps you to actually find voices and give voices to people and you can uh, find solidarity, um, quite fast, but it also brings uh, exposure that uh, that the, that you don't know who is tweeting and how they're going to react and uh, who has what uh, intention. Uh, it's increasingly more dangerous. Um, so I think I think uh, in fact the sense of awareness without losing um, the courage or the heart to stick on to what you believe is right. Um, I think the times are so different that uh, one needs to be, um, I think also techno savvy and smart. The world is too open and it is very difficult to know how to protect yourself while at the same time um, you want to voice your 
um, beliefs and truth. So I think uh, I think it, um, we need more um, reality checks every now and then. Yes. Uh, okay. Why not chickening out? <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note. Um, we do have one important person to thank, Gavin, who has been working away for many hours on the live stream and making this event available to um, people watching remotely, but also to other audiences when the videos come up. And thank you all for coming, especially the diehards who stayed right to the end. And if you can still join us for a few minutes, we do have some drinks outside to um, assuage your thirst after this very long session. So thank you, everybody. Thank you.